Welcome to The Chase Hudson Show, a podcast dedicated to inspiring you to become extraordinary. Each week, we sit down with top-tier business owners, real estate investors, and influencers to inspire you to build your legacy. It's time to level up. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of The Chase Hudson Show. Today, we have Roger Comstock, who is the founder and CEO of Zero Dollar Startup a company which teaches individuals how to start recurring revenue businesses without venture capital, debt, or real estate. This is um, such a great episode. Roger is is one of the most genuine, um, just awesome individuals that I've had the pleasure of of sitting across from. You can just hear it in his voice and how he talks about uh, business, life, um, what, what it means to be successful across the board. So very excited for you guys to hear uh, Roger's story and, and what he's doing with Zero Dollar Startup, which is a, a really, really cool concept. So um, excited for this one. With that, let's dive right in. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of the Chase Hudson Show. Today, we have Roger Comstock. Roger is the founder and CEO of Zero Dollar Startup, a company which teaches individuals how to start recurring revenue businesses without venture capital, debt, or real estate. Roger is a serial entrepreneur, and in addition to Zero Dollar Startup, is the CEO and founder of Flipper, Comstock Consulting, and Tuple. Roger also founded the annual G3 Summit in Utah, which is a conference featuring top-tier entrepreneurs and influencers to help people achieve fulfillment in business and life. Welcome in, man. Thank you, dude. Hopefully that, you know, that was a decent summary. Yeah, man, of course. I'm grateful to be here with Chase. If you don't follow Chase, this guy is uh, incredible. He's got a heart made of pure gold, and so I just feel blessed and thankful to invest some time with him today, man. Good to be on your show. Thank you, Roger. And I can You're tell, welcome. man, just uh, just knowing you for the little bit that I have, how sincere you are, I, I feel like um, following you on social media, sitting here across from you, you seem just like a very genuine, sincere guy. So thank you, man. I think I it's been some time together. Appreciate that. We're right back at you. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, thank you for being here, Roger. The, usually the first question I ask my guests is just to tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Um, early years, uh, kind of growing up or, or high school, kind of early college, just help us understand maybe what formed you to to be who you are today, uh, some of those experiences you had. Yeah, you. man, of course. Um, so I grew up uh, in, I grew up originally in Mapleton and everybody always thought like I was like the happiest person ever. And that was, that's, that wasn't the case inside. Right. And so that was kind of tough. It was interesting. It's, I think the reason I even bring this up is because people ask kind of like how I got to where I am today. And I've been through like years of therapy, right? Like, be, and I think it's important that people understand that, that, um, entrepreneurship is not all sunshine and rainbows and it, it's not all just like people that have figured things out and that know what's going on. Um, it's really important that people understand that like, um, people are human, right? And they, they're, they're wanting to grow. They want to progress, develop, become better. And everybody has challenges and struggles. I had as a kid, um, an interesting childhood. Some things were really, really uh, tricky with some family stuff that happened. And I had a lot of anxiety and, um, an OCD and uh, some scrupulosity is what it's called. And it just, I mean, it's heavy stuff, right? Really, really heavy stuff. But it allowed me to um, develop a very large sense of empathy for people, like compassion, recognizing that like when people are struggling, dude, I just want to like hug them. You know, I just want to yeah. be there for them because life can be, it, it's so good. Life is so good, uh, but it can be very hard too. And it's just important, like for people listening to the podcast to recognize that, um, a lot of times what people see on social media, it, all the fun vacations, me and my wife, we travel a ton and people see on social media, it's like, oh, they're fun. They're on a beach or they're with family again or flying somewhere. And that's all fun stuff. But uh, the real growth and the real happiness and fulfillment comes from the learning, the growing, the developing, the loving, the um, overcoming challenges, all of those things. I love it, man. And I, that's so true. I feel like it's so easy to fabricate kind of a perfect life uh, yeah. or like this highlight reel on, on Instagram or social media. And, and it, it's not, it's not always butterflies and rainbows um, yeah. as you go through life. And um, well, you know, transitioning from, I guess your early years, what I, I saw that you went to, to BYU, Idaho and spent some time at UVU when you, I mean, your high school early days, did you want to be an entrepreneur and going into college? Was that kind of your end game or mindset or was there, 
some shift that occurred there? No, not at all. In fact, this is like a good question too for people listening because I want everybody to understand. Um, it, it it's interesting to see kind of how life plays out. I I went to college because I felt like college was the right thing to do, and I'm only going to say this because I I got an MBA, but I would not recommend college or an MBA to people listening. I think what we find is things have been highly disrupted uh, as far as the way we travel. I mean, it's totally changed over the past 200 years. The way we communicate is totally changed, but education has primarily stayed the same as far as like a brick and mortar location to go learn at a higher level. And there's so many new and better ways to learn unless you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer. Right. And so um, I went to college just because I felt like that was the right thing to do. And looking back, I probably, I'm really grateful for the experience because I, it taught me now that I probably wouldn't have done college. Um, I went, I went uh, and got an MBA only because I felt like, Hey, like this is supposed to be like a golden ticket, you know, and all these other opportunities. What I found after graduating um, with my MBA is that it, it, it's, it's not a golden ticket, right? Like it's kind of a, a dime a dozen thing. And I remember I applied at like Qualtrics when I had graduated, this is years ago and didn't even get an interview like at, at Qualtrics, which was so odd. Um, Cause I was like, this is supposed to be like this big thing. Right. Um, and so I ended up working at a, a real estate investment company and I traveled to Sydney, Montana uh, to manage a, a large asset up there. And that ended up, um, there was it, the, the whole economy of that area was based on oil. And so they struggled. Um, so that didn't last very long. I came down and then worked at Vivint Solar as a business intelligence analyst. And that was fun. But what, what started to happen inside of me is I just felt like I want to do something like impactful. I want to help people and I want to be able to make a difference right, in people's lives. And I knew that wasn't going to get me there. That wasn't the vehicle to do it. And so I, I figured I, I needed to start a company and I was scared to death to do it. Um, people need to know that too. Like they're, they're, that's a very normal feeling if they're thinking about starting a company. It's, it's frightening because, and that's why everybody doesn't do it, but it's the most rewarding thing ever. I, I'll never, ever look back and say, oh, why did I do that? I am so grateful that regardless of the fear or the, you know, discomfort, I moved, moved forward anyway. There, it, was, it was interesting. There was a, when I was at Vivint Solar, I had a mentor and he was telling me, he's like, dude, you need to quit your job. And I teach people how they can stay at their jobs and make tons of money while they're still in their nine to five. Because for me, that was the, that would have been more ideal. Right. But my mentor was telling me like, quit your job, start a company. And, uh, so I just thought about it for a long time and then finally just gathered up the courage. I was like, I'm going to do it. Had no clue what I was doing, like zero, <laughs> zero clue. But I went to the person that I reported to and I just said, Hey, um, I, I think I'm going to go start this company. I can't be here anymore. And she had told me, she's like, Hey, stick around for just a little bit. We'll raise your salary, which is already good. And so it was very enticing to stay. But then she said also, we'll pay you $10,000 cash. If you just stay for the next three months, just stay for three months. And for me at the time, $10,000 was, it's, it seemed like a good chunk of money. Um, and so that made me rethink this decision for, of entrepreneurship, you know? Sure. Uh, so I went back to my mentor, someone that I love and trust so much. He's still a mentor, a great person. And I remember he was standing across the room. I was sitting in a chair across the room and he basically just said, Roger, are you kidding me? He just said, this is the, is one of the, some of the best advice I have ever received and I will ever receive. Uh, he just said, put that $10,000 in a bucket and burn it. He said, you're only thinking about right now. He said, if you could just see like what will, will happen in the future, you wouldn't even think, think twice right, about mm -hmm. this idea. And so, um, I, I mean, I felt like I was going to throw up, super scared, wanted to cry. I probably did cry, but I went into uh, my boss and I just said, I'll, I'll forego the 10 grand, forego the salary raise, like I'm going to go do this. And I did a tiny bit of sales consulting for about two months and then I was just cold turkey out. And that was my, that was my start to entrepreneurship. Uh, but it's, it's ended up being incredibly, um, rewarding, uh, lucrative. It's great. I mean, the, the money's awesome there, but even more so like being able to help people. Um, it makes me so happy, dude. It's just the best thing in the entire world. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I've, I've heard that, uh, you know, salary is like the drug they give you to, to kill your dreams. It's kind of a, yeah. kind of a thing. And it, it, yeah, it can be tough when you're, when you're making pretty good money and it's recurring and it's every two weeks and you know, it's like, it's easy, you know, whether you're doing a lot or not. Yeah. That just, yeah. That comes it's just in. there. Um, so yeah, definitely takes courage. Kudos to you. And I think it's always interesting to hear the, the timeline. Um, so you, you did BYU Idaho and then did you, you went on a mission and 
did you go to uh, your your MBA right thereafter, or was there a time where you were working between your undergrad and your your MBA? Good question. No, I went from a mission to um, schooling, and then directly from graduating with my undergrad to to your an MBA. MBA. Okay, yeah. got it. Cool. You bet. I've learned since then too how important it is to get really clear, right? As as I, and friends that you've you've had on this show, Dave Allred, Casey Ba, right? Those guys are all they're, they're all very much so focused on this idea of clarity and making sure people have a, a clear picture of what they, they want. It makes it so easy to get there when that picture is, is clear in their minds. And so now I know exactly what I want. And before, when I didn't, it just kind of seemed like I'm just going to do what I'm supposed to do. Right. That, that, uh, the world teaches, go to school, get a job, get into corporate yeah. life. So interesting stuff. So what, when you, when you quit Vivint Solar, you got your MBA, had you been working there for, for how, about how long? Oh, Vivint Solar. That's a good question. I was there for probably nine months, nine two, months, okay. two year, right around there. So post MBA, you're kind of working full time. What, so what was the first thing you did when you, what was the idea of quitting your job? What was the, the business plan or even was there? It sounded like it was pretty new at the time. When you yeah, quit. man. Um, I look, it's, there's such good memories. Uh, there, it was the best of times and the worst of times. It was it was challenging. Um, I believe in God, and and I think He plays a major role in the success that I have experienced and I will experience. I mean, forever. I think He's um, the best, and He's the best business partner anybody could ever have. I'm like thoroughly convinced of that. It's it's interesting because, and sorry, I'm getting choked up. I don't mean to, but uh, it's important because it's we realize as we go throughout life, like we need other people, right? Like we if we try to do anything on our own, it's going to be it's going to be a long ride. Right. And so I've learned that I need him and I need other people to, we, we all do like our economy is based off of reliance on other people's products, services, and people being willing to buy and us being willing to buy. Right. Uh, very interesting, but there's uh, Jesus is the man. So he's just the best. I would, it, it, what, what he taught in Matthew six, he said, behold, the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns yet your heavenly father feedeth them. He says, are you not much better than they? So, uh, excuse me, what's cool about that is this idea that people get really scared. I have been really scared before about like, ah, are things going to work, right? Like, I don't know. Um, but what I love about what Jesus teaches is it's, he's saying, look, if these, if these dang birds, they don't do any work, they don't do anything, but they always have a place to sleep. They always have food to eat. They're, they're taken care of, right? They're always, aren't you better than the, those birds, right? And I learned that lesson very quickly. And that was a huge, um, that was a gift uh, for me in my life to understand that. I, I, I remember to answer your question, um, I, I, was, I was just like selling websites door to door because I had no, I literally had no clue what I was doing. I was like, I just need to find people that need business. And so I found this group, um, that, that my mentor actually, he was, they had built sites there. And so he kind of became this little partner where I could uh, get somebody that needed a site and do some business through them. And I was just knocking up and down state street in Orem. I can still remember it was hot. It was, it was like middle of July. And I, I, I was thinking like, what am I doing here? And it seems like every entrepreneur has a story like this. Like I was walking up and down this road, like, why am I even thinking? I was in like, just a couple of weeks ago, I was in this air conditioned room with my friends laughing with free lunch, getting, like you said, paychecks every two weeks. And now I don't even know if I'm going to get paid and I'm trying to find business. I don't even know if it's there. Right. And, uh, but I just, it, it's really cool because in entrepreneurship, you just like put one foot in front of the other foot and just keep moving. And I don't know why or how this works, but it was the last door that I knocked on <laughs> like that day. I'd been knocking all day. I was just like miserable, hot. And I was like, this is just crazy. You start like rethinking, like, what did I, sure. did I blow it here? <laughs> like, you know, um, yep. but I knocked on this door and, uh, this wonderful individual. His name was Richard. He opened the door. Uh, actually it took him a while to get there. It, I knocked, nothing happened and it kind of like creaked open and I was like, hello. And this guy came back from the back. His name was Richard, um, had me come inside and they had just been given a couple million dollars for, a for a grant, um, to build a website for, uh, f for a university here. And so that, that deal was like 11,900 bucks, which was really cool to get started. I was like, wait a minute, it works, you know? Uh, so I got, got a deal. And then after that, there was um, a $68,000 deal and a $23,000 deal and some other small deals. And I, it was way more money than I could have ever dreamed of making it at, uh, at Vivint Solar. Um, 
was quick. Uh, the, 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 not, not the, not the results, but recognizing that like, this is the right, this is the right path, you know? Um, so that was a lot, that was a lot of, that was a lot of fun kind of figuring out. And then everything kind of evolved from there. I started building things out and creating different partnerships and making sure things were where they needed to be. And, uh, it, it's been the best thing ever, man. So fun. That's great. Well, yeah. Going back to what you said about having God be a, a partner in your, in your business. I, I don't think a, a lot of people perhaps d- separate, you know, God in, in more of a religious, you know, church, um, charity, like family, and maybe you don't think so much about how, you know, God being part of a, a business plan, right. Or, or your partner. And I, I think that's really insightful how you said that. And I think, um, leaning on him to, to help you be where you should be, say what you should say, um, know where to go, um, how to spend your time is, is really important. And as, as a newer entrepreneur, something that I'm learning, um, more and more to be dependent upon is I can't do it by myself. You know, I've got a great business partner, but both of us need, you know, more than, more than each other. And so having some of that divine intervention, um, is, is what I think is, is going to take us to the next level. So I, I appreciate you saying that and bringing that up because I, I don't think a lot of people um, heavily consider that as much as they should. In their, Maybe uh, one thought to piggyback off that too, Chase. I love what you just shared. In the same, in the same chapter, uh, Matthew 6, the last verse, uh, I think it's verse 36. Je- Jesus, this is so important. And I'll, I'll tell you why, especially for me when I was starting Uh, He says, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow will take thought for the things of itself. He says, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And so what what I find, because I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, um, tons, and a lot of the times what stops people from finding success is this concern or worry about what might happen in the future, right? Like what could go wrong and all of these things that might fail. And everybody's so scared of what other people are going to think and all of this stuff that just doesn't really matter. But it's, it's, they're challenging, right? Thought process for people to kind of move through. And one of the things I've realized that it, we, we live by nature is set up uh, to live by laws, which is really cool. And one of the laws of business is that if we're continually learning and growing and wanting to progress and just being willing to move forward, inevitably we're going to find success. And what we find in all of the world's best entrepreneurs, are, they're not geniuses. Right? So a lot of people be like, man, their IQ just must be that, you know, off the charts. And it's not their IQ, it's their resiliency and their grit. They're just willing to keep trying and they're willing to fail in the face of people that will criticize them and say, well, I've got an idea and I have a vision and I'm going to accomplish it. You know, um, we look at, I I used to trail run a lot and it was, it was interesting because you start at the bottom of a mountain and you look up at the mountain, you're like, dang, like that's, (laughs) that's a long way. And if you think about that journey and what it's going to take, it can be a little overwhelming or discouraging, right? But at the bottom of the mountain, you just decide to put one foot in front of the other foot and then your legs start to burn and it, it starts to get really hard. You start to sweat, you lose your breath. It just, you realize you have miles and miles to go. I ran to the top of Mount Timpanogos, which was not, I, I would not recommend that. Mm-hmm. That was a, I don't it's know intense. if that was the, it was intense. Yeah. And you, you just feel like, I don't know, right? Like if I should be doing this, but because your body, everything inside of your body is telling you to stop. Right. And what's really, really cool is that at that moment you get it to make a choice. You have a decision that you get to make and it's like, well, I'm just going to keep putting my foot in front of the other foot, even though it's hard because eventually I'll, I'll end up at the top of this mountain. Uh, and what's cool about that to any of the listeners is there's a view up there that cannot be duplicated, um, or expressed simply by words. And there's the way that it smells, the way it looks, the way that it tastes, this experience that you have is unique only to individuals that were willing to pay the price. And that's a powerful principle, right? Like super, it's super cool because I remember like you get to the top of the mountain and you, you like take a picture and you look at your phone, you're like, dang it. Like it doesn't do, it doesn't do it at all justice. There's no way you could come back from that, that mountain to somebody and say like, look how beautiful it was. They just won't, they won't be able to see, they have to be there. And entrepreneurship is very much the same way, right? Like it's, it's very challenging. Um, but 
the view from the top as you, and there's new peaks to climb. You'll get to one peak and there's another peak, right? That you get to go reach. But the view from up there is something that is, uh, it's remarkable, right? And it's something once you've tasted it, you want everybody else to have it too. You know, you want to share that experience, but it's just important for people to know that even though it's hard, as long as they're willing to follow these kind of laws of business, put one foot in front of the other, they'll get there. Right? Inevitably they will, they will find success, which is yeah, it's awesome. I love it. And, and I couldn't agree more with your point about entre the most successful entrepreneurs are not, or I'd say in most cases are not the smartest people in the room. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes, sometimes that can be a detriment in terms of analysis paralysis or overthinking or feeling like you have to have it all figured out. Um, where it truly is one foot in front of the other question for you though, when, when you are in those moments of just continuing to persevere, you're not having success. It's hard. It, it, it doesn't seem like anything's working. Um, what's the, what's the balance between just continuing to push down a path that doesn't seem to be having you ha having success in and pivoting and trying to, to maybe change you know direction or do something different i don't know if you've ever run across any scenario like that where maybe just something wasn't working after a long period of time and you, and you had to you had to shift something or change a strategy to, to to ultimately have success yeah i think what's interesting about that is it, it really boils down to and this is where an individual's um why will real because people have read the books start with why by simon sinek and it, it almost sounds cliche now like you got to figure out what your why is but it's it's a very very deep principle um to internalize and understand because when we figure out why we're moving towards something it won't matter at all what the world chooses to to say um that will inhibit us from getting there so for example uh, take Henry Ford, right? For the longest time we traveled with horses and buggies and that's all we did. And it worked just fine. All right. I, I mean, it, it would have been so easy for, uh, Ford to just say like, I'm going to, I've got this idea. It's, it's so cool. Anything that we're using these cameras, these mics, I mean, everything we have started is just an idea in someone's mind. They're like I'm going to build it, you know, and they're going to hit roadblocks, right? So Ford could have said it was, I love your question about pivoting uh, and, it's, it's not so much that uh, Ford, Ford's idea was, okay, I'm going to build this automobile and come hell or high water, I will make it happen. Um, it doesn't matter what anybody tells me can't happen because that's, that's where people get into trouble when someone says, you can't do that. You know, Roger Bannister, we'll get back to Ford, but quick tangent, like Roger Bannister um, in 1954, he was, everyone said, it was 53 or 54, but they said, you cannot break the four minute mile. Right? It's impossible. The human body can't do it. It's not even capable of it. And so for years, everyone just believed that was the case. Like that's, it was a, it was a limiting belief that human beings had about their ability to accomplish something. And Roger Bannister came onto the scene and just said, I don't give a dang what anyone says, I'm going to do it. And the day he broke the four minute mile, um, it was, it was not ideal like weather conditions either. And he did it in like three, three minutes, 59.4 seconds. But what was interesting about that was a month later, somebody else did it, right? mm -hmm. and then it became easier for people to do. And so oftentimes when we see people kind of leaving a particular idea, um, it's, it's because either the, the idea didn't have wheels, right? They didn't have enough of a vision of how it could work behind it or because they're allowing other people to say it can't work because the idea of an automobile with pistons firing and all these, this, this fuel and all, I mean, it's just crazy that it even works, but this guy is, had this thought and just knew it was going to happen. Um, and he kept moving forward regardless of all the failures that were there. Um, same with the light. I mean, this, this is a cliche example too, but the light bulb, same thing, you know, Edison's like, I learned 10,000 ways not to make a light bulb, but figured out one. And so I really believe if somebody has enough vision about what they want to accomplish and they have an idea that will serve people well, and that can provide value, like the, the cool thing about the light, was something that absolutely has provided insane amounts of value, the vehicle, same thing. So either someone has an idea that doesn't provide value and that's when they should pivot, move mm -hmm. towards something that provides value, or they do have an idea that provides a lot of value, but they're allowing other people to distract them from building it, creating it. And that'll be something they regret, right? Like uh, John Greenleaf Whittier, he's, 
he said, of all sad, sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these it might have been. And so we see these people that have uh, ideas are a dime a dozen. What we recognize in today's um, economy is the people that are rewarded, fortune favors the brave and the bold and those that are saying, hey, my idea may or may not be the best, but I'm going to execute. Right. And that's, yeah. that's the coolest thing ever. And most of the time that execution is messy. Um, it's not perfect. And yeah. they're going to, the people that do choose to execute, they're going to get a ton of criticism and ridicule. Yeah. Um, but they'll figure it out. And everybody that was criticizing will go shoot. <laughs> yeah. They did it. Right. Yeah. And so it's interesting. That's great. No, I, I, I love that advice. How, when people do have doubts, um, or, or, and, and probably that probably results in some self doubt, maybe, you know, as you're, as you're going through taking these steps that don't seem to be leading anywhere, how have you overcome, you know, some of that self doubt that, that maybe creeps in every now and then, maybe it hasn't for you, but you know, how have you been able to stay resilient, stay persistent? Are there any tactics or strategies that you feel like you've, you've utilized? 100%. And I have felt that. And it's important that people know that. Yeah. And that can be really hard, right? People feel like, I don't know if I can do this. Um, if you put a flea in a little container, it will only jump. Fleas can jump like six feet high, but if you put it in a little container, it'll start to just feel like it, that's its total capacity is just right there. Right. And so one of the challenges that people have is they don't understand how powerful they are and what they can do. And the minute they clue into that, everything changes, uh, which is really powerful, right? It's kind of like the crabs in a bucket analogy where, You've got, let's say you've got 30 crabs in a white five gallon bucket and one just kind of peeks its little like claws over the side and sees this huge beach. All of the other crabs are going to start trying to pull it down, but that crab got an idea and a, and a viewpoint, something that it can dwell on and ruminate on of what's possible. And as long as that idea stays in its mind um, and it wants it, it, has a desire to get it, it will find a way to, to make it happen, right? And so what's, what's interesting about self-doubt or challenges that people have in business, those stem from inhibiting mindsets about what the human uh, psyche has the ability to kind of push beyond. And so I, I, I'll, I'll take two examples. It's really, really interesting. Um, the way we view the world will affect everything for us. E everything. Um, so if, if we have, I, I believe gratitude growth and giving are the three primary like rudimentary foundational ideas that allow an individual to experience real fulfillment, gratitude, growth, and giving. That's what the G3 summit is based on. But what's, if we, if we look at individuals in life, people think that money makes them happy. And that is, that is one of the most unfortunate lies an individual can tell him or herself because it's not true. It's just, it's really not true. Um, what's, what's interesting though, is like, if we see, we can see people that are, in fact, I was talking to an individual the other day and he had a friend that has sold a company for $600 million. And to some people would be like, Oh, that'd be awesome. Right? Like I'd love to sell a company for $600 million. And they think that would make me happy. Well, this guy was miserable. Like that's an interesting thought, right? 600 yeah. million bucks. You'd think like that guy has got everything that's generational for a long time, generational wealth, you invest that. And I mean, it takes care of people forever. Right. But he, he had came back to this individual and he said, I just sold the company for $600 million. Man, it's hard because it puts everything in perspective. Right. And he says, and I have no one to share it with. Right. And that's just like bummer. You know, that's a, it's an interesting thing. Um, so what's, what's crazy is that you've got people that have all of the wealth, all of the ginormous, I mean, all the nice cars, houses, whatever it is that somebody is wanting, they think makes them happy and they're miserable. Right? There's people that are living that life that are really, really sad. And then we have an individual like Viktor Frankl, right? Who, if you haven't read Man's Search for Meaning to those listening, great book to read, but he was literally, so these are people that it, from the outside looking in with all of those lavish things, they look like they're in heaven, but they're living in hell. And it's all based off of the way that they see things. It's all based off of their mindset, right? Their perspective, their paradigm, right? And so it's interesting. Then you have somebody like Viktor Frankl, who was actually living in what observers would define as hell, stripped away from all good things that he had, clothes ripped off of him, naked with all of these other 
man in this concentration camp, zero food. He was skin and bones, being worked to death, literally, people being worked to death. His wife was taken away from him. He had, and people were literally just dying in those concentration camps because they had nothing to live for, right? But Viktor Frankl is remarkable, right? He, he created a heaven in his mind, right? The way he saw things changed everything for him. And uh, so it's interesting, like with people who are struggling right now with self-doubt, I have, right, in the past, what they can do is start focusing on it. And it requires work, but it's some of the best work an individual can do in his or her life is figuring out how to think about things because it changes everything. Jesus even taught it. The kingdom of God is within you, right? The way that what made Jesus who he was, was the way that he saw things and the way he saw people, right? Like in the book of Luke, he's, he goes out like nine times, Mark or Luke, nine times to just be alone. And you wonder like, what was he doing out there? Like he's learning how to, he's learning how to think, right? And, and getting his mind where it needs to be for what he's doing. Um, and so that'll make a big difference because it, it literally unlocks certain things for people. Um, we, we see like a caterpillar and it's not supposed to be a caterpillar. And so it may look at a butterfly and, and that is, it's, that's what it's supposed to be. But it may look at that butterfly and think, man, like I could never be that. Um, and, and that could, if, if it had the ability, if we could humanize it, it may cause a sense of discouragement and frustration because it won't, it doesn't think it can reach what it was built to become. Same with acorns and oak trees. There's no, I was always under the impression that acorns just became oak trees. That this is like what they did, but only one in 10,000 acorns becomes an oak tree. Oh, wow. Which is crazy. It's so applicable to our life. Like that, that acorn was not supposed to stay an acorn. It was, it was not, it, that's not the reason it was created to remain an acorn. It was, it was made to become an oak tree, right? And so with human beings, I'd imagine if we could take a ratio, if we had the data, it would probably be fairly similar, Sure. right? To this, this acorn that decides to put roots down and it requires breaking apart, literally tearing its, what, what it was, it becomes something new, unrecognizable from what it was before, because it was willing to put roots down and keep itself open. Yeah. So good. So, so inter interesting, dude, like for people, self, yeah. self doubt. Uh, um, yeah. They can get <laughs> mindset makes a big difference. Yeah. So good. And I've been, I've been doing this, um, priming exercise. Tony Robbins has this like yeah. 15 minute thing that you can do on YouTube. And, um, you know, the, the idea is to, to get your mind right for that day and to vision things you're grateful for. Um, to vision successes that are that you've accomplished in you know in the in the current tense um, and and to be able to try to just set set off on the right foot for that day and and so it, I think that's that's exactly right Roger it's it, when you have those moments of self doubt it's reflecting on what you're grateful for what you do have and then remembering the vision you, you ultimately set out to, to accomplish um, and just trying to uh, to stay to the path man that's that's really good. Um, well, cool. Getting back to your, so getting back to your story here. Uh, so about how old were you when you graduated from your MBA or I guess when you quit Vivint, what, what, what age were you? Oh, dude, I think I was, let's see, 28 or 29. Okay. 20 or 29. Yeah. So you start selling website. Is it, was it domains? So maybe d dive in a little bit there. You're going door to door. Is it like, Hey, we're kind of like, um, a GoDaddy or something where you're selling a domain or you're building their website. What was the product? Yeah. Building, building like a website. So, so okay. So you would develop, they'd have a product and idea. You'd say, I'll create a website for you. Um, get it up and running. Were you doing the coding and everything by yourself? You outsource that or how did that work? Yeah. Outsource it. Um, I, I, th I thought that stuff was interesting, but I definitely didn't want to be in the weeds. And so I'd outsource the work. And over mm -hmm. time, what I learned is that you can get great margins and a lot of recurring through having other people do the work if you're just basically the connector sure um which is awesome so yeah that's what we were doing okay cool so uh, what would did that company have a name um what what did you call that first business but, so that's tuple tuple okay oh, that's tuple okay yeah, and tuple's still it's I'll, still going oh right? yeah dude it's yeah. the coolest thing ever um i love that company and that's what i teach people to do is i teach them how to build their own version of tuple and it's not just it's not just websites or okay. it's a lot of different things that people can can learn which is awesome got it okay so tuple started that out of the gate um 
yeah, and how, and I know, so now you have zero dollar startup, there's flipper. So walk us through kind of from when you started tuple to your, your uh, subsequent businesses that you started and kind of how that unfolded for you. Love to hear it. Yeah, man. Good question. Um, I learned a lot. I failed a lot. Um, and I loved that experience a ton. I wish we focused more on like why failure is a good thing, but I, I realized things that were working, uh, things that were working with tuple, I doubled down on and things that weren't working. I got rid of pivoted right away from them. Yeah. And, uh, what, what I found too, is that as, as I started understanding how many ways there are to make money, like you get out of the corporate world, you're like, holy cow, there's so many cool ways to make money. And I found that I was getting distracted, um, and, and making money with, with different stuff. But what's interesting is if you're a jack of all trades and master of none, it's almost like the, the sun heats the entire world. However, if you put the energy of the sun, if you focus it under a magnifying glass, you're going to light something on fire. And that's what will happen to an individual's um, ability to do big things. If they focus the energy they have on, on one thing, there's a great book called the one thing I would recommend to anybody where you're like, it, they'll start a fire. Right. So for me, I had, I had, uh, yeah, Duvera investment group. I had tuple, I had flipper, I had Comstock consulting, $0 startup. And, um, while those things were great, it was awesome. Uh, I, my sweetheart, we, we had a lot of fun things going on and, but she said, just focus on just um, zero dollar startup, and it has exploded um, through just. While it's fun to have all these other things going on, just that narrow focus, it it makes a big, big, big difference. Really That's big great. difference, and so super cool. I, yeah, and I I resonate with what you're saying in terms of the jack of all trades or shiny object syndrome. Yeah. Well, yeah. When you come out of the corporate world, you're like, dude, you know, you've got guys selling solar. You've got guys doing, you know, tech, you've got guys doing, making widgets or in a factory and, and making tons of money selling toilet seats, like whatever it is, you know, there's, there's so many avenues, um, to go down, but if you try to, you know, chase different things and spend five months on one thing and then pivot to another thing for five months, you're, you're never going to have real progress. And so I, I really like that point about going all in on one thing. And, and, and that, I, I feel like it's very, popular thing to, to see on social media of like, I've got, you know, 10 streams of income or eight streams of income. And that's great if, if, if you can diversify, but I think first step is get your one stream, right. You know, yeah. and grow that. And then once you have that figured out, take those, take that stream and invest it, diversify into, you know, investments and other things. Cause it's tough. Like you said, if you're running three or four businesses at the same time and trying to, to manage all that, you're probably spread a little, little thin. So. Yeah. Or a lot of thin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, tell us a little bit more about zero dollar startup. Um, would love to hear kind of what I, and I, you know, looked at the website, watched your video. It's very interesting, but for those who haven't would love to hear what the, what the overall thesis is, what you're offering for, for folks who are coming into the program. Totally. Um, it's been, I mean, it's, I, I've got a good friend named Randy Garn. He's awesome. And I was at his office the other day. If you don't know Randy, you, people should know Randy. He's the best. But he's like, what do you want to be doing in five years? And I was like, exactly what I'm doing right now. It uh, makes me so happy because I grew up, my my initial, um, my major was elementary education. I love teaching. And I taught, uh, for the LDS Church, I taught Institute for three years on and off, which was a lot of fun. So I just love, love, love to teach but I also love business, but teachers don't make a lot of money. And so I was like, right. I want to make a lot of money so I can do a lot of good, but also teach, which is great. And so I, I built this fun company tuple that just pays money every month. Right. And with very, very little effort, um, once the deal's done, it just money comes in. And the way that that's happening is you'll have, um, I focus primarily on helping people learn why, helping home service companies is a great place to start. And it's because they are so good at what they do, whether it's an electrician company, a plumbing company, an HVAC company, basement remodeling, pergola building, uh, carpet cleaning, window washing, right? Like there, there's so many different, um, people to help in that industry. And they're so good at what they do, but they have no idea how to acquire customers. Mm. Like they are absolutely clueless to how to find people. Like my, my brother who lives in Texas, he got a knock on his door and he opened it and it was an epoxy flooring business owner. 
and he was trying to find jobs. Right. And so what's so cool is like, if, if, um, like my students, I teach them like, what if you were to call, let's say there was a, uh, an epoxy flooring owner and his name is Dwight Schrute. Right. And so you call Dwight and you say, Hey, we find a ton of people who already need their floors epoxied, or we can find a ton of people who already need their floors epoxied. Uh, we don't do that kind of work. Can you handle any more jobs this month? Or are you totally slammed? Well, Dwight is like, yo, yeah, please. Like we would love more work. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what you're creating is this sense of uh, a symbiotic relationship between a group of people that are really good at their trade uh, and their customers with a ginormous value gap between them. Right. And that's where a lot of the sweet sauce lies is finding a niche, a group of individuals where there is a ginormous value gap where you can provide a lot of help and you can get paid really good money for that. Right. And so what's, what's cool. Um, like I've got a, a student right now, he works with dentists, but last month he made 12 grand. He closed two deals and he made 12 grand in a week. Uh, and $11,000 of that was pure profit recurring. Uh, so it's $132,000 annualized passive income within a week, closing two deals. So cool. Wow. Another one of my students last month, he closed six grand worth of business, fully passive, without having to pay a thing. It's, it's crazy stuff. Yeah. Like, so he, and it, I was on the phone with him. I, I love this guy. And he's like, dude, this is crazy. He's like, I just feel like I'm creating money out of thin air. Um, and it's, it's a really cool process. And I don't want to, I need to be clear for listeners. I don't believe in get rich quick schemes. Right. So there's a lot of those out there. And, and so the people that get into my program are learning lifelong skills that will allow them to do very, very well in, in any economy, which is a huge opportunity, right? Regardless yeah. of what's going on macro or microeconomically or who the president is, my students are learning how to create freedom. And, uh, it's, it's exciting to watch, right? Like this guy. So th this, that student who created $6,000 in passive income last month, um, he has a full-time job too. Wow. And he's making dough at his full-time job. And so this is just extra fun money to do Yeah, whatever he wants with. That's great. It's really so, cool. I would love to walk through like an example. So maybe going off of this, this student you mentioned. So he walks into a dentist office or calls, you know, some, some dentists, what is the product that he is pitching to them? And then how does it, how does it work from the recurring side? And you mentioned website domain. So is he going in and, and saying, I'll facilitate creating a website so that customers can find you, you can find your customers and what, what are, what are, what's a dentist paying for and what, what's the service they're, they're receiving? Good question. So I'll, there's three kind of, I'll, I'll just give like three basic ideas. There's more to this in the program, but I'll give just three really easy ideas. We'll start with like the most basic. Let's just start with like what a website is like the HVAC company. Let's say there's a, a group called ABC HVAC, right? Those guys do not know how to build a website. And most of their website or a lot of their websites look like Super Mario Brothers, right? Like 1992, they're pretty bad. Yeah. And they need help, right? If you were a customer deciding between this company and this company, and you looked at this website that was looked terrible and another one, you're going to go with the competitor. So you can call, say you called that company and you say, hey, like, let's get you some curb appeal. Make sure that this thing looks good, that represents who you are as a business. Um, and let's say that you charge that company $5,000. What's cool is you don't have to do any work at all. You can find another group that will develop. There's a group that I introduce my students to and they'll do all of the work for the student for like 380 bucks, build everything. Wow. So what's cool is, and this, this is probably my favorite thing to talk about. Um, so they'll, they'll get to keep the difference, right? So 5,000 minus 380, the student pockets that. Sure. But not, not only do they get to keep that up front, they get the, the client's going to get a beautiful website, which is cool. They'll get just what they needed, tons of value. And those guys make a lot of money. And so they don't mind what they're paying, right? We talked to a plumber once that was making 10 million a year. So that's a great deal for them. Pride's a lot of value, but then you can charge a recurring amount too. So let's say that you, you're talking to this guy that owns H ABC HVAC and you say, Hey, like we'll charge you $199 a month just to manage your site. Well, the total cost for the student is going to be like 16 bucks. Yeah. So now the student not only had to pay to create, they, they didn't have to pay anything to create the passive income. They got paid thousands of dollars to make money every month doing, sitting on their biscuit, right? Like sure. these students don't have to do um, anything for that. They, there's somebody else managing it. It's just money coming yeah. in. So the reason I love that example so much, I'll give two other really short ones, but I love this so much because I think real estate's great. I love real estate. Um, we, we use it for tax purposes. It's an amazing thing, but the challenge with real estate is it's pay to play, right? And it's, it's, it can be expensive. So, I mean, right now let's take our, our economy 
where we're at. Let's say there's a five hundred thousand dollar single family home. Uh, let's say it's going to be it's not owner occupied. So let's say it's twenty percent down because it's an investment property. So someone's going to need to put a hundred thousand dollars into that deal, and it's going to be in a thirty year mortgage. Well, what's crazy is the economy is bonkers right now. And so let's say that they their mortgage. We'll just make numbers easy. Let's say their mortgage is like thirty five hundred bucks, and they're renting it out for thirty seven hundred bucks. Well, they just spent $100,000 to only make $200 a month in cash flow, maybe. They'll cannibalize that cash flow if there's any sort of repairs that need to happen. Sure. Right. And, and taking away, now there's huge benefits, as you know, in real estate, like the, the tax stuff or depreciation or the, the fact that the asset can appreciate or principal pay down, any of that stuff. But surely, like cash flow, they spent 100 grand to make 200 bucks a month, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And that's hard for people. Um, that's a very real example, by the way, too, of what where we're at here, especially in the state of Utah. I mean, yeah. so anyway. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's, inter- it's yeah. really interesting. And so what I want people to know is that, like, when people think passive income, their first thought is real estate, right? Like, I got to buy properties. And I think that's great. Um, but they need to know there's there's, because of the great world we live in, I think this is the, the world we live in has so many opportunities. Um, there are way um, easier ways to make stupid amounts of money passively, like ins- a great amount of money. Um, and that's why we see these students I tell you about, right, this example. So another thing that, that somebody could do is, and that's why it's called Zero Dollar Startup, right? So it's teaching people how to start a company without any, any sort of money that has to go into these deals. So let's say there's another guy. So we had Dwight Schrute. Let's say there's Jim Halper who owns this company that's an electrician company, right? And let's say that he's in Spanish Fork, Utah, and he wants to make sure people can find him, right? And so people type in electrician, Spanish Fork, Utah. Let's say that all of his competitors show up. Well, people aren't going to go to like page five or six of Google, right? Or where they're looking for this help. They're going to pick those first few. So that means Jim is losing money if people aren't finding him. He's, right. he's, lighting money on fire. So if you were to talk to Jim, like this is the coolest thing. Let's say you talk to Jim. You're like, Hey brother, like we got to make sure people are finding you, um, that you're taking care of here. So I'll, I'm going to, I'll charge you three grand to start working with me. Right. So Jim pays three grand and then 799 a month. Well, what's cool for the student, if they did that deal, they would make $3,000 and that goes into their pocket that like, there's no cost that's associated with that. It's just like a startup fee that they would charge to Jim to start working some skin in the game. And then seven ninety nine a month, their cost on that is going to be like 187 bucks. So that student now is making $612 a month doing almost nothing. Like these, these groups that will do the work, the fulfillment, they'll actually send reports to the client for them. Yeah. And so that's the equivalent of buying three homes. So if we look at 500 K for a single family home, multiply a small single family home multiplied by three, $1.5 million or $300,000 of capital right, put down to make the same amount that somebody just got paid thousands of dollars to, to create. And the last example would be like the, the one I just told you about with like the epoxy flooring owner, Dwight, right? Like you can yeah. generate leads for them. But I teach people how to do that in a way that is very unique. Um, I, I basically teach people how to create like an online traffic stop. And so if, if they have clients... The, the internet has changed everything for people um, it, because it, back in the day, like I sold door to door and it was like you had a neighborhood that you had to knock in, right? You had like a hood that you were supposed to cover and that was like your place. Uh, what's cool about what my students learn is they have the whole country. They can, right. They, I mean, there's 27.2 million small to medium sized businesses across the country and 2 million enter the economy every year. There's no way they're going to talk to all. I mean, there, there, there's so much business to be done. And, um, so many people that need help. And so, you know, yeah, they say they talk to this poxy flooring owner, uh, that's in Texas. They talk to one that's in Florida, one that's in Maine, one that's in Oregon, one that's in Utah. What's so cool is one single page can serve all of those companies and it's all automated. So like somebody comes in that needs their floor epoxied through automation, it's automatically rerouted to the right business owner. And they just get a text message like, Hey, this person needs their floor epoxied. They have a three car garage. Here's their name. Here's their number. They want it done within a week. And so the student, let's say, so the last example, it's super fun. Let's say the student charges a client that owns an epoxy flooring company, $2,000 to start working with him or her. And then $1,200 a month. It's, it's amazing. Their cost, let's say their cost is 300 bucks. So now they just got paid 
uh, two or three grand up front plus $900 a month recurring to service this, this client with very little, um, work required. So super, super cool stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, um, a concept that I, yeah, I didn't even know you could do that. I mean, it's like an arbitrage of, of like, Hey, exactly it. You've got an outsourced, you know, third party group that manages all your SEO or website creation. And then you're going, you're the face of the business and you're kind of the intermediary and making a good amount of profit on, on that, uh, transaction. It's, yeah. I love it. It's, and it's pretty simple too. It's, it's, but it sounds like it's scalable. And once you kind of set up the infrastructure, have the right contacts, you could, could really grow it depending on how much you wanted to. Yeah. So that's, that's great, man. How many students do you have now? We've got oh, probably, I don't know, hundreds. Um, I should know the exact number. We've got hundreds. Those that are in like the high end program, it's like 120 that are in like yeah. the high end yeah. program, but we've got, um, a lot of students that are yeah. learning this stuff. I think in my opinion, it's the, it's the very, very best place for, um, somebody to learn business because there's no risk. Like, sure. like, and I mean, there's no risk because the $0 framework that I teach, it's somebody finds someone who needs help. They get paid first money comes into their account and then they provide value and then they just repeat it. Yeah. So the challenge with real estate is if they buy a house and they're covering a mortgage and then the economy gets bad and that renter has to move out some other place. They're on the, they're on the line for that mortgage. Yeah. In this case, if somebody they're serving, let's say that Dwight doesn't want to have their help anymore. There's, there's no obligation. Sure. It's, it's super, super cool. Yeah. So how are you? So, so tuple was you initially creating this concept essentially, right. Of, of being a consultant on the internet, you know, doing advertising and, and helping people with their website. So did you, was it just, you saw that as an opportunity to help others get into a similar, you know, space and you started zero dollar startup to really just help others recreate tuple sounds like in, in some, dude, some regard dude, it's it's such a great case study for what we've talked about it was literally just like a messy messy action i was sitting at at my office at tuple one day i was like dude i bet people would want to learn this stuff and so i put a yeah. facebook post out and i was like would anybody want to learn like how mm-hmm. i built tuple and all these people were like yeah that would be awesome and so um i started reaching out to him i held like this little boot camp up at kiln in lehigh it was like yeah. six weeks um just to get like some data like see what people thought about it. And, um, it, it did really well. Uh, people loved the program. And so I was like, dang, I gotta, I gotta double down on the things that are working. And so, um, the program has uh, grown big time. There's tons and tons and tons of content. We have coaches that help the students, uh, lots of fun stuff, lots of great stories about what the students are doing and what they're building. We had another student from Penguin, Utah, and he, in his eighth month in the program, he made thirty thousand wow. um, dollars, which that was really big for him, uh, really really big. And so, kind of kind of cool to see that's what people great. are doing. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Um, how awesome. are you managing or balancing your time with Tuple? Are you still spending time on Tuple? You know, doing the same thing, going out and finding customers to bring into your platform, or or are you spending? It sounds like like you said earlier, most of your time is zero dollar startup. Yeah. And Tuple's on autopilot kind of Well, thing. what's cool? Yeah, my accountant, dude, Tuple, that's why I love it so much. My accountant was like, holy cow, uh, Tuple just pays every month, uh, just spits out money, and I do almost nothing for it. I mean, very, very, very little work um, for it. Yeah, I, I, I moved my, fo- my focus from, like, finding clients for Tuple to teaching people yeah. about it because I needed I, – I, it's tough to split focus, right? Yep. And so – I decided like, I love teaching. I love this whole idea. I'm having the time of my life. Um, so I'm going to focus on this, but yeah, I still have, um, uh, still have tuple clients and it's, uh, it's been a blast, man. Lots yeah. and lots of fun. So cool. Well, I, yeah, it's, it's again, another one of those things where it's like, uh, <laughs> I mean, it sounds awesome, right? So it's like shiny object syndrome, but I mean, say for anyone who's listening, go check it out. I mean, it sounds like a, a really great business model and a way to make some passive money and passive income and, and, and get off the ground. Like you said, with very little risk other than time and, and perhaps, you know, a, a, a fee that you charge for, for the consulting and education platform. But yeah, I love it, man. That's great. Well, uh, just a couple other quick things, Roger, wrap, we'll wrap up here, man. Um, you have a really awesome social media presence. You know, you've, I think you've got 40 or 50,000 followers and you put out some great content. I'd love to hear as, as a newer, you know, I, I haven't very been very active on social media. Um, my up to about 
four months ago when I started kind of doing some some posts with this with podcast. But how have you grown that following? What, what what's some advice you might have for people who are looking to build a, a more of a personal brand um, on social media? Yeah, good question. I've worked with groups. Like I'll, I'll tell you the things that have worked where I failed and things that worked well. Um, I've tried like working with groups to be able to get followers and get comments and all of these things. And that just doesn't, it's not effective. Um, the best thing that people can do is just put out good content. Uh, I've, I've done the same, like on LinkedIn, I've got a bunch of followers there and it's, it's just it, it like you're talking about things that are important to people and that they resonate with. Um, trying to, it, it's, it's interesting. Like you see, the, the content that people love to consume is stuff that they can relate to and that makes sense to them. And so like anybody trying to grow um, a social account or trying to make an impact, I think the best advice I'd give is just do it in a way where you're addressing, like addressing what matters to people. If it's business stuff or relationship stuff, most people resonate with like health, wealth, or, um, um, relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Those three things are, are big when it comes to what people are generally interested in. And so focusing on one of those things based off of a product or a particular focus, uh, will definitely help a ton. Cool. Yeah. And, and getting around good people too. Like, um, I use integrated marketing, which is great. So there's a friend that I have, in fact, I'll, this is r really great advice for, for listeners here. I've got a friend, his name's Devin Burr, Mr. Burr, you might know him since you're in real estate. He's, he's awesome. But he has a million followers on TikTok and like 200,000 on Instagram. And he's one of the best people ever. I just love this guy. And so him and I just partnered up and I'm doing a live to his group next Tuesday. And what would be great is I'm sure we'll get a, a good chunk of students from that. Um, so that'll help Devin. We're also going to help those students. Um, and then it also gets my name out there too. Uh, an audience that fits our ideal client profile. Yeah. I've done the same thing with people like Chris Noggle, if you know him and it's just mm -hmm. it, it, great, great way to kind of build it out. Yeah. A lot of collaboration, yeah. you know, just like overlap where you can getting in front of other people's audiences. It, yeah. Super, super smart. Totally. Um, and then you seem very well networked. I mean, you, you mentioned Randy Garn, Casey boss, some of these, some of these individuals that you have relationships with, you're doing your G3 summit which had, has some awesome speakers and, and individuals is what advice would you give to somebody who's trying to just build out a personal network, um, you know, get in front of established individuals who've been successful and, and create kind of that personal network? Yeah, I think this is a great spot to, I'm, I'm glad you asked this. I, I It's interesting to me, um, what stops people from getting what they want in life is just not being willing to ask. There's a great book by a guy named Randy Pausch who was diagnosed with cancer. He was dying while he wrote the book. He died right after it was finished. It's called The Last Lecture. And one of the things he talked about, and it's so good. I'd recommend it. Like, I hope people read it. But one of the things he said is like, just ask uh, for stuff. And it's interesting, like in starting a podcast for me, uh, uh, people seem to think that other humans are inaccessible, like that they're like these gods or something. Like they're just like, oh, those, they must be so busy or they can't talk. But like... Um, and it's so I had, I was golfing the other day and somebody ran up to me. People think those things about me, which is the weirdest thing. It's I, I want everyone to know, like, they're like, are you Roger Comstock? I listen to your podcast. And I'm like, yeah, dude, like I'm just some like just regular, regular guy. Right. And all of these people are, every one of them are people that love their families. They love helping people. They love doing good things more than money. All of these individuals that you've referenced, they care more about impact and like making the world a better place. And so, What's cool for someone is, is if somebody wanted to get to know Dave Allred or Casey Barr, or Randy Garn, these are the types of individuals that um, they don't put themselves above anyone else. They, they'd be, I'd imagine they'd get back to a message, right? Like yeah. uh, it started my pod, my podcast. It was just like, Hey, like, do you want to come hop on the show? And um, a lot of my relationships with these people started through the podcast. We became really, really good friends and uh, it's been awesome. So I would encourage anybody that's trying to figure out how to network just to, find people that they want to get to know and invest time around and then just, I mean, just ask. Yeah. It's great advice. And, awesome. and agree. Couldn't agree more. Um, very surprising how receptive people are to spending a little bit of time to, uh, and I think, you know, in their minds as they've been very successful, it's almost a form of, 
um, you know, education or charity or just giving of their time to help, you know, on a platform, whether it's a podcast or going to lunch or something. So it's, yeah, you'd be surprised. And I, I agree with that for sure. Um, last question for you, Roger, we, we kind of talked a little bit about this, but it's, it's a question that I ask, uh, most of my guests, but just when you think about life in general, all the areas where you, you know, you could strive for greatness, I guess, what, what is success? How do you define success in, in your life? Dude, I love this question. Um, I love it because it's different for everybody, isn't it? Um, I'll recommend another book for people in answering this question. Uh, what a great place to end too. There's a great book called How You Measure Your Life by Clayton Christensen, the late Clayton Christensen. I wish he was still around, but arguably like one of the very best business minds we've ever had, right? And what, what he talks about in the book is that success is defined so differently from individuals based off of what they think will make them happy. So there's the investment bankers working on Wall Street, doing 120 hours plus a week that don't have anything outside of the bank and money they're making. They're divorced and their families are falling apart and they're miserable that way but they're like successful, you know? Um, and then there's other individuals that I actually would, Randy has a great book called prosper out. Uh, and he talks a lot about how like true success is, is about more than just wealth. It's, it's about impact and relationships and these things. And so I, I would define success as, um, probably the way that Covey would like looking at the end of my, because I, I believe there's a lot of people who don't make a lot of money and they're, they're going to be a lot more successful in life than people that have made a lot of money. And I think what, what, what people will find at the end of their lives is that in the game of Monopoly, everything goes back into the box. And it doesn't matter if people own Park Place or Boardwalk and had hotels on them. At the end of the game, the pieces just go back into the box, right? And um, someone had taught me that once, and I just love that idea. What's going to matter is what, what people do did for other people, right? And how they served and how they wanted to take care of somebody else that may have been struggling. And uh, so I like to look, I like to think of my eulogy, what that might look like. I like to look down the road and say like, what is my wife going to say about me? Right? Like she's my best friend, right? And when I'm dying someday, I want her holding my hand and I do not want her thinking like he was just so focused on money. We make a lot of money. That's great. But who, frankly, like who cares? (laughs) I, I, who gives a dang, right? Like we, it's, it's, um, I mean, I want her feeling connected and loved by me and knowing that like, uh, I just, she was my favorite person in the world to make memories with. That will be that that's success to me. My life will have been so successful, right? We don't have kids yet, but when we do, right? Like I plan on my success as a parent won't be determined at all by them as a child. It'll be 20 years down the road, like watching what my effort did. Cause I want to be there with my kids. I, I think one of the common challenges that people, it's, this is a lie that people tell themselves. And it's like, it's, it should be like nipped in the bud as fast as possible. People say that like in life, you can either, there, there's no such thing as like a work-life balance. That's garbage. <laughs> that's, that's garbage, right? Because they think like, I'll, I'll just go work really, really hard and make a lot of money now. And then I'll, I'll be back when my kids are grown, when they're teenagers and I'll spend a bunch of time with them then. I mean, what people don't realize is that from zero to seven years old, those children are, um, they literally have different brain waves happening that are susceptible to neuroplasticity and they're learning a ton of things from their parents. And if that dad isn't there, that mom isn't there, children are going to be highly affected. There's going to be a lack of success as a parent without that person there at a ball game. I, again, defining success. If my kid's playing a basketball game and he's shooting a buzzer beater shot, I would never ever under any situation want him to look at the bleachers and not see me there being his biggest fan besides his mom. Right? Like I would want him seeing like, Hey, like I love you and I'm proud of you. You're the man. And so at the end of my life, I want my wife there. I want my kids there. And I want people who I have, made a positive difference for knowing that I loved them. Like that, that that's that they were important to me, that they are valuable human beings. That's, that's successful. Um, my bank account won't matter like at all, but that's just my view of success and everyone's is different, but I know it makes me happy, like truly fulfilled. And that's, that's what a lot of people are searching for and they don't know where to find it is fulfillment. Like what makes me feel full like in life? And it is gratitude, it's gratitude, growth, and giving, those three things.
school. There's there's no better way to end it on, on that note, Roger. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, couldn't agree more, man. Thank you. Good Thank you man. for your time, um, for, for insight, for your wisdom, for the messages that you shared with, uh, with our guests. And for anybody who's listening, go follow Roger on, on social media, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, and, and be sure to check out Zero Dollar Startup. So thanks again, man. You're well. Sorry. Lastly, make sure it's the right account. If they follow me, there's like, there are so many scam accounts on oh, Instagram. Yeah. So make sure that it's Roger, R-O-G-E-R dot Comstock. Um, just Perfect. that's it there. Okay. I love it, man. Thanks again, Roger. You Appreciate bet, the time. Thanks for listening to the Chase Hudson Show. If you liked what you heard, please leave me a review and subscribe to this podcast. Reviews really help us to find better guests and to improve the overall quality of the show. If you'd like to connect with me directly or want to learn more about investing in real estate, send me a DM on Instagram at official Chase Hudson. Again, we really appreciate you listening and we'll talk to you on the next episode.